Thank you again for everybody for dialing into this. We had some mishaps in the beginning, but I think we'd like to kick off and um, and 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 toss it over to John, who will take us through the first slide of his presentation, and then we'll get into the discussion. All right. Well, welcome everybody. Yeah, I can actually hear myself now. I hope that is coming through clear to you as well. Uh, if we could advance the slide to the, the summary flagship piece, that would be great. Thank you. Uh, so I'm, I'm, I'm the appetizer here. I'm just gonna spend a couple minutes talking about the context and the purpose and the motivation for launching this piece, which I, I think will spark uh, what I know will be a healthy discussion between Bill, Bob, and Allie. Um, so from Kaya's perspective, originally what we were trying to do was admittedly fairly singular and narrow in purpose. And that was, is that we have just launched our fourth edition of our credentialing curriculum, our Kaya curriculum, the fourth, the, the newest uh, level one and level two uh, versions of what candidates study with. Uh, and we wanted to make sure that we highlighted some of the areas in which we were maintaining credibility and currency, particularly in the areas of ESG and private credit, co-investing, et cetera. We also thought that it was a good time to leverage an extremely sophisticated and experienced set of stakeholders and our members to provide some crystal ball future predictions as well on the future of alts. And so uh, much of this is also based upon uh, a fairly comprehensive survey that uh, our members answered that really got into and teased out where they think the relative opportunities and alternatives are in the next five years. And just to put that in perspective, you know, we're about 17, 18 years old. We're a Kaya, that is. We're a late teenager. Uh, when we first started, uh, alts represented about 6% of total global investable assets, which was about roughly five, 5 trillion at the time. You fast forward to today and it's double, it's 12% of global investable assets and it's almost, it's almost tripled in dollar size, a little over $13 trillion represented across the different asset classes within alts. And the headline uh, from the survey was that by 2025, we expect that number, the members that is, expect that number to jump to between 18 and 24%. So significant significant growth expected as well. So we looked at we looked at what was uh, a a reminder about the importance of the Kaya curriculum staying current and I, I think some really good insights from our 12,000 members. And then internally we, we looked around and said, okay, well that's interesting, but you know, Prequin does good work on the future of alternatives. Boston Consulting Group just last week had a had a report on this. Bain does it, Goldman, JP Morgan, everybody's got a white paper on the future of alternatives. What is our unique kind of angle on this? What, what can Kaya bring that no one else can? And to make kind of lots of uh, iteration and dialogue uh, a shorter story, as a professional body, uh, just a reminder that we're unmoored, we're, we're unhinged from serving any particular master. We're not a trade group, uh, so we don't represent, we're not bound to representing a certain constituency. So we're liberated to provide and, and obligated in many ways to provide an objective voice on behalf of the investor, the underlying beneficiary. So the only master we really serve in primacy are is the greater good of society and underlying investors. And that provides a really uh, unique perspective for us to speak into, sometimes challenge and poke and, pro and uh, provoke uh, the industry on ways to improve it. Uh, and so we at Kaya are not uh, homers for alternatives, just for the purpose of being proponents, nor are we demonizing for the purposes of demonizing. We want to speak into it objectively with that white hat of the professional body uh, for the greater good. And, and that's where the crescendo of this piece and much of the discussion today is gonna be centered around, is that in addition to kind of a look back and a look forward, we said, what is our response to that? The, the, the tide has come in, the genie's out of the bottle, private markets aren't going away, they're here to stay, they're probably gonna get even bigger. How do we make sure that we mature, hence the name of the piece, into a true profession that has a social contract, that has a sense of respect amongst 
uh, Main Street and in the public square. And so this four point call to action was meant to be uh, a, a, a pair to, to coexist with this expected significant growth. It's a rallying cry for all the actors within the industry, whether you're LP, GP, consultants, regulators, the academy, and certainly us as the professional body representing the whole group. Uh, and again, we want to foster a true profession. It's an industry now. It's a little bit of the Wild West. It still is operating early in its adolescence, again, hence the name. And we want, we want to build much more investor trust and a foundation of transparency and expectation. So these four, as I, as I finish, these four uh, pillars that represent this call to action are deepening education, recommitting to ensuring that there is a rite of passage. There are barriers to entry to be a professional in any profession that you can imagine. Uh, this can't be a porous pro, uh, proposition where anybody can set up, a sh can set up, a, you know, a, a banner above their doorway and open for business. There needs to be a rite of passage and barriers. Secondly, improving transparency. Uh, that I think this. Uh, in many ways is the subject of much of the media attention, rightly so. This idea of difficulty of performance comparison is IRR. Have we found the right metric even to showcase uh, what performance is, whether an illiquidity premium does exist? What are appropriate management fees? How do we defend what are relatively higher fees versus the public markets? What's the standard of care as owed to clients? There's not a consistent sense of fiduciary duty. Uh, in this part of the, in this pocket of the industry. Third, advocating for diversification. Uh, I think this is where we have been very um, vocal. And I think challenging the, the typical media and might even say GP narrative that this is all about the next frontier of alpha. When I think of alternatives, when Kaya thinks of alternatives, it's meant to be uh, arguing for the benefit of a collection of beta over a long period of time. The idea that a, a sophisticated uh, fiduciary that is stewarding a long-term pool of capital should be looking at multiple asset classes so that those investment outcomes over the long term are fulfilled. And that comes through those basic tenets of diversification, which will lower volatility and drawdown risk, provide inflation protection, provide a little bit of income, and certainly grow principal. And that can't be achieved with just one or two asset classes across the long term, at least. And then finally, uh, I think the subject of, of a lot of our discussion, just because it's very timely, is this idea of democratization. The idea that alts could be available, accessible to the retailer mass affluent customer. In the US, and this is the case in most of the developed world, the accredited investor rule, those that have access to private pools of capital are typically, typically based upon income and wealth. And the SEC is looking at broadening that, liberalizing that a little bit. The DOL threw their hat in the ring and has said that private equity, at least, uh, did not breach the prudent investor rule. And so you've got a little bit of uh, regulatory agency mud wrestling going on, just like a couple years ago with the fiduciary rule. So we'll see that how it works out. But we, Kaya believes that this is good in the long term based on diversification, but it's got to come with appropriate protections, safeguards, and education. So I'm going to stop there. That's a brief 60,000 foot view of what we were trying to accomplish and, and where we came out as far as our messages and our call to action. And I'm going to hand it back to Ali. Great. Thank, thank you very much. Um, Bill, I think we should delve into a couple of the topics that John just ra raised in the call to action. Um, we've seen expansive growth in the industry and, and uh, as you highlighted to 13 trillion today. Where do we, where have um, you seen the assets coming from predominantly and what's been the driver for such uh, expansive growth? Well, it's, uh, thank you, Ali, and I appreciate you having us and I apologize to the audience for the technical difficulties. I'm glad yes. you solved it at the 11th hour. Uh, so it, it's been a very interesting space and what some people may not realize is that the endowment model was born not by uh, the Ivy Leagues. It came out of the Ford Foundation who gave a grant to the Common Fund literally 50 years ago, uh, 2019. So the endowment model is 51 years old. 
And when I think about trying to access alpha, and I, I think a big part of what we want to talk about today might be just finding the beta first off, but if you're trying to find alpha, you're going to find it usually in illiquid, inefficient markets. And back, well, I began my career and get out of college in 1982, and I saw a very interesting thing in The Economist not too long ago, that in the early 1980s, when I was just starting in this industry, there were less than 24 private market GPs in the entire world. So if I'm running an endowment or a foundation and I've got a sophisticated investment team and I'm thinking, my God, look at this sea of opportunity, this sea of inefficiency. And the early adopters uh, did quite well and to some extent may be doing quite well uh, today too. But I think as we fast forward from 50 years ago to 40 years ago to maybe fast forward all the way up to today, these markets have gotten a lot more crowded. There's a lot more GPs, there's a lot more fundraising that's gone on, and there's a lot more efficiency and dispersion of results. And one headline is that if you're thinking about hedge funds or private equity or private debt or VC as asset classes, you are destined to get probably the average returns, which in many cases are pedestrian and don't look very different than the uh, public market proxies you're trying to, diverse away, to diversify away from. So if you're thinking about approaching private equity, you've got to get it out of your head that it's an asset class where the median to the top quartile results can be separated by thousands of basis points. So it really requires a, a very careful lens to look at, focus on, and, uh, and nobody wants to admit they're going to get the average returns. But the averages are averages, and they said they're, they're not very good. So I think the rules of engagement have changed. They've changed probably quite dramatically. I don't believe the endowment model is dead, but if you're going to treat these as asset classes, uh, it, you're, you're probably better off uh, sticking with the 60-40 to some degree. Great. Um, where, where, where are you guys seeing, or, or I should say guys, sorry, Bill, what are you seeing from the um, – the institutional investor today, be it um, hospital plans or endowments, are they still keeping the 30% rule or are they upping that? We all understand that they have, they're under some duress. Yeah, so I think it's a very interesting second part to your question, Allie, under duress. Uh, you know, I, I think that uh, some of the early adopters really were the endowments of foundations and now it's pension plans and with democratization, almost everybody can saddle up to this trough. But if you look at, at the public pension plans, I think the word duress marries up quite well against that. And if you, if you look at the, the uh, average public uh, pension plan, the funding ratio is just under 70% at the end of 2019, with the return assumption somewhere between seven and seven and a half percent. That funding ratio of 69 and change is the lowest it's been so far this century. And the average public pension plan was fully funded at the beginning of the century, circa 2000. So we are in a very perilous period in that I feel you've got markets, public markets that are priced to perfection and an economy that is just doing horribly. And the disconnect between Wall Street and Main Street, and we've all read about this, has never, ever been so wide. And I think most strategists, if you sit back and ask them realistically, on a nominal basis, where do you see a 60-40 over the next 10 years? Most are going to tell you something less than 5%. And you throw 200 basis points of inflation on that, you're down almost in the cellar. But then you turn around and say, Jesus, I got this 7.5% return hurdle. How am I going to do it? Well, I'm going to do it by backing the truck up to private equity. And in some cases, and not to name names, but you probably read some of the same things I read, why not lever the public fund up by, say, 20 percent and see, uh, see where that gets me? And in some respects, they have no choice. Uh, so I think that we as professionals, and this is about the transparency, We've got to sit down and have very transparent and open conversations with either the LP or, or anybody on a retail basis coming into this space and explain what alternatives can and can't do. And one of the things they can't do is to be the wide receiver catching that Hail Mary pass in the end zone. Sometimes, and if you live in Boston like I do, a Doug Flutie of Boston College will sometimes throw that pass and sometimes gets caught. 
that is the exception to the rule. So, so I think we have an industry that's under duress, public markets that are under duress, and we'll probably talk about capital formation at some point, so I won't wander into that uh, yet, Ali, but, uh, but I think that we've got to understand how these private market securities and, and alternatives, broadly speaking, fit into a portfolio, and you can approach it around diversification, dampening down volatility, yielding better risk-adjusted returns over time. That's the best use case for all this. The other thing, um, another point that your, your report touched on was um, the um, impact of new strategies and the impact of, of um, increased ESG integration. Can you touch on particularly ESG and, and what impact we've seen there? And then maybe um, more broadly talk about the liquid alt um, phenomenon, if you will. Yeah, so uh, so ESG uh, is an interesting uh, concept, and uh, I, I think if we polled everybody in this call today and you said, are you for <laughs> or against it, I think we'd have 100% that says they're for it. But it's got to be a lot more than just aspirational, and, and we do a lot of surveying of our members. We touched upon it a little bit in this report as well, and the allocators are all in, the asset owners, they're all in that this is very, very important. But I think for maybe for some of the reasons that I cited before and that it's tough being a fiduciary because you're being asked to do a lot. And on top of that, to be a responsible citizen and, and achieve what in the short term is maybe not achievable, which is the elusive double bottom line. And I think if COVID uh, has shown us nothing else, it's really underscored how short-term oriented the public markets truly are. And I say that from the vantage point that uh, I was in Europe uh, in Feb, uh, and it still seemed like at that point, this was a phenomenon that was based largely in Asia and almost specifically in an individual city in China. But then you have the S&P kind of clicking along north of 3,300, and it didn't breach that level until like the last week in February. But then when it does, all of a sudden everybody says, oh my God, the, the, the dependency on, on the supply chains uh, inside of, uh, of China. So I think that really a lot of this was noble and foreseeable and whether or not uh, all data let us down. But I think if you're, you're getting back to your question, VSG, uh, this is a long-term play. It's a long-term risk. And if you're taking a long-term horizon, and many investors can and should have a long uh, horizon, this has got to be treated as part of your risk management approach to investing. And if you think about the future impact of things like carbon and what it means around food supplies and construction and even the use of concrete, uh, this is a risk that you should be managing in. But, uh, but I think we've got a market that is hell-bent on quarterly reporting. And I think that just makes the concept of ESG all the more ticklish. So, so I, I think it's out there. It's a belief. I think we're going to see more and more of it coming to the fore. I think Europe in general has done a pretty good job about it, uh, less so in the U.S., maybe even less so in Asia. But we've got to find cooperation. Uh, th this concept of, of going it alone, uh, a strategy by a country or region is going to be very, very difficult. And we need big countries like uh, China and the U.S., not focused on populism, but focused on cooperation. So still a lot of work to do there. So I'm happy to, to answer a follow-up question if I wanted off the appointed path, Allie. Um, yeah, thanks. I think um, just to add to that, I think, uh, and you touched on this, ESG means something different to everybody. Um, and it's difficult to assess um, in certain certain strategies, how, how to measure ESG. So to your point, education and, and collaboration is going to be important going forward. Um, I did ask a little, uh, touch on briefly on liquid alts. I think we've seen that grow um, over the past couple of years in prominence in po people's portfolios. Um, do you believe that's a strategy that will continue to gain traction? Yeah, it's, uh, yeah, short answer is yes, uh, but again, uh, it is uh, maybe a, a few shadows around that that have to be explored. And, and if you look at the performance, again, uh, treating them as asset classes because it makes it easier for this discussion, but if you look at the performance of, say, hedge funds, which is, that's the, the typical area where you see replicated uh, into a 40-act fund or a USIT, 
that they generally performed pretty well relative to a 50% peak to trough drawdown of the S&P 500 at the GFC. But then we wake up and say, all right, this is so good. Why do we take what is a pretty sophisticated private offering, put it into a 40 act fund with uh, a lot of disclosure, uh, limits on illiquidity, limits on uh, percent holdings, and why don't we put it in a daily price wrapper to make it all seamless and, and let's just roll that out and how do you think that's going to turn out? I would say that if that's the rules of engagement and no education, no literacy is going to be tucked in there, I don't think it's going to turn out so well. And I think that what ended up happening to a large degree in the latter part of this first cycle, uh, the GFC leading up to COVID, that I think many investors said, you know what, if the S&P seems to be compounding at 10 to 15 percent, why do I need this liquid all that actually might have been performing reasonably well relative to realistic expectations was up only six or eight. So we've had this risk on trade that has persisted. And I think investors are not so much thinking about crisis alpha. They're just swallowing crisis beta because it seems like it's there for the taking. And you've got a central bank that's acting as if the ultimate stop loss limit uh, on uh, people's portfolios. This cannot go on forever. And I think understanding uh, where we are in this market, what is driving it, I, I think many investors don't fully understand that. So I think diversification is a free lunch, always will be a free lunch. Sometimes that free lunch is kind of hiding in plain sight. And unfortunately, we've had a very unusual period of time where this risk on trade has pretty much been alive and well for 12 years, which used to represent several market cycles has been one long risk on trade. So we 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 threatened to talk on uh, to touch on capital formation. I think this is a, a good time to launch into that. So um, call to action number four: democratize but protect. Can you elaborate on on your findings there and what changes do you see in the um, in the capital formation space and how will managers? I know this is a three prong question. I apologize. And how will managers be able to take advantage of that? Uh, so uh, maybe uh, uh, just a, a quick uh, history on this. So again, uh, not to date myself necessarily, but uh, when I started this industry, uh, the Wilshire 5000 might have been about 5,000 names. And then it became a misnomer on the upside. It probably drifted in the late 1990s, 95-ish uh, time frame. Maybe there were 7,500 names. Now there's 3,500. Uh, so the, the number of public listings is shrinking and it's probably shrinking for a couple of reasons. And more recently, these are germane that you've had a private market that's just been a wash in capital. Uh, last time I checked across the entire private market spectrum, including real estate, uh, somewhere around two plus trillion dollars of uncommitted LP capital waiting to get into a deal. So liquidity is no longer uh, a, a problem. And then you've got the hassle of regulation in the public markets and the scrutiny attached to that. And, and certainly when it comes to uh, some of these issues around tech companies and privacy, uh, nobody wants to come in and be excoriated by uh, a congressional committee led by somebody like Elizabeth Warren, who does that so well. Uh, so why not just stay under the cover of night? And the, it used to be, if you wanted to be serious about capital formation, and one of the things, I think we have a couple of charts in the report alley that we, with attribution, took from the Thinking Ahead Institute, which is part of Willis Towers Watson. And I think they used Google. I don't have it open in front of me. But if you looked at Google when they first uh, went public, uh, I don't know, circa 2002, 2004 timeframe, and the amount of capital they raised publicly versus what they raised privately was like a multiple of 70 plus times. So the vast majority of their capital, their growth, uh, and the, the maturity and profits of that company came while it was a public company. Then you got the likes of Uber and then more recently Spotify. And Spotify has been interesting. They came to the market as a DPO, a direct private offering, looking to raise zero capital. And it was really, even though they may not admit this, was a mechanism to exit the GPs and their underlying LP partners as a liquidity mechanism at a time where I believe Spotify had a market value, uh, market cap equivalent to like a Marriott uh, or Target when it had never ever turned a profit. 
So I, I think that as investors, uh, and there's a complicated, uh, not overly complicated, but uh, maybe another leg to this alley I should pull in is that the shift between the retirement promise and the nanny state that maybe our parents grew up with, where you work for the same company for 20, 30, 40 years, if you retire, you might get a gold watch, but more importantly, you're going to get a defined benefit liability at a fixed dollar amount, maybe indexed to inflation from that retirement date to the day you die. And it might even be on a second to die basis that your spouse might get a continuation of that same benefit. Yeah. That is largely an antique. So now we've taken the retirement responsibility away from the nanny state and dropped it into the hands of the individual with no education around risk management or longevity risk. And the longevity risk rarely gets talked about, but that's a huge problem as well. At a time where they can't get access to these private markets or all the capital formation is happening in the first place. So if they're gonna have any hope and sense or responsibility of a comfortable retirement, and we're saying, you have to stay in these two narrow lanes. You, you can buy fixed income where the risk-free rate net of inflation is less than zero, or you can buy these mature equity securities where uh, net of inflation mid you get 3%. That's not a very good answer. So we've got to find a way through the lens of education transparency. And if that can't be done, we should not do it, but find a way of getting greater access into these uh, private markets. Sorry, I was on mute. Um, okay. you, you, you mentioned um, the DOL has um, relaxed some of their regulations and currently um, in comment mode on target dated funds. Can you expand a little bit upon that um, as to what that would mean for the industry? Yes, and I see somebody who almost beat you to the punch. I saw a question just popped up as you were speaking, Ali. So this is going to be the two birds with one stone. So the DOL uh, came out with this uh, just a couple of weeks ago, and I don't know if the equivalent of a private letter ruling, but they basically green lighted the ability to uh, uh, have a target date fund's own uh, private securities. Uh, there's still the concept of a fiduciary. There's still the con uh, concept of, a, of a, a plaintiff's bar. So I think that most fiduciaries are going to be very, very careful. I don't think we're going to see a rush to this. And I think also the SEC has to, I believe, get involved in this because if a target date fund is a registered 40 Act fund, you're still stuck with that 15% illiquidity uh, sleeve inside of a 40 Act fund. So I think the SEC will probably have to get involved in whether or not investment trusts are deployed, uh, where there might be more flexibility. But I view it as, as a good development and maybe a good start because here, education and transparency are always, always very important. But I saw a stat recently, which I forget the source, it might've been uh, the Wall Street Journal, and maybe I just heard it in passing on, on CNBC, but, but the stickiness of money in the 401k space is much, uh, much better than the average investor trading in a Robinhood account, as an example. And I think that the stat I heard is that through this COVID drawdown, and at least right now, the V bounced back up, is something like 70% of those assets never moved in the first place. And I think that's a good, a good thing because if you've got a 25 or a 30 year old that is saving for retirement, that's not going to come for 30 or 40 years liquidity or these market fluctuations should not be their number one concern. And if you look at over longer periods of time over the course of 10 year periods, for instance, you'd be very hard pressed to find 10 year window where you would have lost significant sums of money. And while uh, myself or John or you, nobody can predict where the S&P 500 is gonna be tomorrow, next week or, or next month, but Somebody said to me, you know, 30 years from now, you expect it to be higher. I think you could have a more cogent discussion over a longer period of time. So matching the duration and the horizon of your assets against the duration of your liabilities is very important. And I think the DOL, hopefully with, in conjunction with the SEC, is smart to be thinking about these target date funds. I think that might be an excellent place to start. Do we have another question? I just want to... I think we had another question. Um, where do you see growth coming from in a, from a sector perspective? 
Well, yeah, I'm not uh, a, a, a strategist per se, but and I don't know if this is germane to this speaker's question, but uh, this uh, participant's question, Ali, but I think it follows up in the same theme about uh, democratization and access. So, so if I'm looking at Hertz, which is a perfect example, would I rather be buying the secondary equity offering that uh, was destined to go to zero uh, when, the SC, when the SEC had weighed in and say, hey, we may have a problem with this offering, and the concept of where equity sits in the capital stack, would I rather be buying or having access to something like that in the public markets versus going into the private markets and buying Hertz's debt as a, in a distressed debt fund for maybe 20 cents in the dollar, there's no contest. So I think that you've got a lot of managers out there that are thinking about and raising funds in the distressed space. And I think we, we have a market, as I said earlier, and I'm, it's just not a prediction by any stretch, but we do have a market that is priced for perfection. Uh, the participation level is horrendous. I saw something in Barron's that the top 1% on 56% of that market cap and the bottom 90 on something like 12 or 15%. And again, uh, maybe to throw my perspective in terms of my uh, timeline in it, uh, I was born in 1960 at the tail end of the baby boomers. And one of my greatest mentors always acted as if he's a real estate wizard. He'd buy a house and have his pick of the litter and then uh, 10 years later be up and he'd sell it. It occurred to me one day that I was his exit strategy, that it was the next generation of baby boomers who are picking all this stuff up. But now as all of this market capitalization, all these uh, homes and everything else are gonna be liquidated, they've gotta be sold to somebody else. And I think that we are gonna reach a pretty volatile period in this market going forward. And I think an asset that might've been priced for perfection today might be priced at a more distressed level, which could be an excellent entry point going forward. So I think distressed in general, I think could be a very interesting area. I see another question out there. Um, many academic and industry studies reflect that smaller managers of capital can and often do outperform larger managers. What role do you see these managers playing in a more volatile market? Well, yeah, I think uh, it, it may be less true today than maybe uh, X number of years ago. But if I, I, I think an, an area that in, interested a lot of institutional investors were the smaller cap names, because again, uh, less covered by the sell side analyst, less efficient. And if you did some good old fashioned fundamental research, you could find very, very good value. I still think to some extent that is alive and well. I think also with some of these smaller managers, and I think this is true in the public as well as the private markets, if you're thinking about a big LBO fund, the ability to go out and put something into a portfolio like that is, is gonna be a big ticket size. And if you get to that size, you've got a lot of uh, potential competition from other GPs to, to sovereign balance sheets to a lot of other shadow capital. And you're not going to necessarily be buying at the very best price. But but nimbleness, I think, is a hallmark of, of uh, good investors and finding uh, solid tranches of alpha. And I think that certainly there's always you hear about the career risk of hiring smaller managers and startup managers. But I think there could be a tremendous opportunity in this space. And I think the nimbleness that some of these strategies can bring forward uh, could potentially be uh, value added for uh, certainly for a family office and maybe to some extent an institutional uh, asset owner. Thank you. Do you feel that smaller managers will be able to take advantage of uh, some of the new avenues of capital highlighted in your report? Uh, I, I, I believe the answer is yes, and I think what we're going to see is a fundamental shift. And uh, John mentioned uh, the uh, Boston Consulting Group uh, report uh, that came out, and uh, and when I don't know, I picked up on it. Maybe the audience didn't. When John described Kaya as being unmoored, he used the word unhinged as well. And I think sometimes <laughs> he says that he's referring to me. <laughs> I wrote, uh, I write a, uh, a semi-weekly, uh, every other week blog. John participates in it as, as well as our colleague Aaron Philback. And, and some of them I think were provocative to a point. 
And, and I wrote one that came out Monday. You can find it on my LinkedIn page. And it was on this report. And I thought the report was very, very good. But unlike ours, which was written from the lens and the vantage point of the investor, this was very much written for what the asset manager should be looking to get uh, and see in this, uh, in this future of the market. But an interesting point you made to your question now, Ali, is that I was surprised to see the split. They said that uh, global AUM is about $89 trillion. 58% of that is institutional. And then by proxy, 42% is retail. But that retail piece grew 50% faster than the institutional piece just in 2019 alone. So by the split of the pie and by the growth rates, we're not that many clicks of the dial away from the retail assets dominating. Uh, the uh, starting to dominate the institutional. I think that trend's going to continue as DB wanes and DC takes over. So I think there's going to be a lot of things up for grabs. And I think we're going to see a less sophisticated uh, asset owner and probably a less sophisticated uh, asset manager to some degree where you're not going to have the big institutional shop, the big institutional consultant like a Cambridge Associates and the big smart sovereign wealth fund. You're going to have maybe a wealth management firm catering to the mass affluent, uh, and there could be an RIA tucked in between. But a lot of these RIAs that we talk to are uh, figuring out how to access alts, and you've got a, a population coming in that wants return, but they're much, much more risk averse. So there's a lot of things that have to be managed into that uh, into that stew, and and I think in, inefficiencies in our industry as well breed opportunity. And I think the smart uh, manager that can get in the middle of this and act in a strategic way with the end owner of these assets, I think has the potential of doing quite well. There's a couple more questions that have come in. Um, will the regulators permit the democratization of the alts industry? Uh, well, I'll let, uh, I'll let John uh, maybe uh, talk to that one because uh, uh, he wrote an open letter to Jay Clayton, and uh, I think he scared him so much that Clayton said, you know what, I need to go and take over uh, the Southern District <laughs> because that's guy like Bowman is not leaving me alone. So John, uh, well, well, John, John, don't leave because the next question's for you as well. So uh, go ahead. <laughs> Oh, perfect. Yeah. You know, Jay hasn't answered me yet, which is just shocking. Um, I think the answer is it's already happening. Uh, I, you know, as I alluded to it in the opening that the SEC has been playing with this idea of reshaping what is now a very binary. You either have the money or you don't, meaning the proxy of the ability to invest in these opaque asset classes is simply a function of how many, how much discretionary income you have or wealth you have historically. I understand the history of that, but this this came out of the 33 Securities Act. It hasn't been updated since the mid 80s. So at a minimum, you've got to reprice and repeg this to inflation. But more importantly, I think what Kaya is appreciating is that you're looking at this and saying, we need to turn this on its head. That this is actually about education, not how much wealth you have. And there is just as much as Bill outlined, perhaps even more reason for someone with less wealth, less of a nest egg, less cushion, to have a diversified portfolio over the long term than someone that, that's got a lot more flexibility. So the SEC is moving quickly. They opened a comment period in December with, with Jay per, perhaps leaving. Uh, and with COVID, I think that has probably slowed a bit. The DOL, as I, as I also mentioned, has gotten ahead of it and said that at least private equity is at least inherently not imprudent, which uh, it's interesting they needed a ruling on that. But I think the lawyers were looking for an out to be completely honest. So I think we're already seeing the tailwind and, and this is a, a tsunami coming in. And the, the, the question and the concern of, uh, and the motivation for Kaya is simply that all of these beneficiaries of a more diversified set of tools over the long term must be properly trained, cared for, and stewarded with fiduciary, highly skilled advisors. And that's where Kaya wants to make sure that, uh, that we're playing our part. I guess a follow-up question to that uh, from, from the audience is, uh, will a change in um, leadership in the White House from Republican to Democrat have any effect on that? Will the SEC allow this? 
I think it will have an effect, at least timing. I mean, you saw the, sadly, the partisanship of the fiduciary rule debate of a few years ago that I thought was really botched personally in, uh, at the SEC level uh, after the DOL had certainly an imperfect attempt at it, but at least a starting point. Um, so part of this is whose domain is this? And, uh, and then, as you said, you have this overlay of partisanship that's, that's playing with the lives and the retirements of individuals, which is just, a, sadly, it's a product of our divisive uh, capital right now. But, uh, but yes, I will think that at a minimum, it'll change the timing. Uh, it may just uh, drop off the radar. Uh, you know, you saw how diluted and gutted the fiduciary rule got once you had a shift in uh, in appointments at the SEC. And I expect that we'll probably lose a lot of momentum if that changes this fall. And I think, John, uh, th this whole concept of uh, of more centrist approach, I think that's been absent to a large degree. But I, when you've got somebody as senior as Elizabeth Warren bringing forth regulation that's called Stop the Wall Street Looting Act, there's so much wrong with just that title. Put aside how provocative that is. First off, the private markets are the furthest thing from Wall Street. Wall Street is a public market. So the private markets are the private markets, and they couldn't find Wall Street on, on a map, I don't think. <laughs> but she, she, Elizabeth, focuses on empowerment of the teachers and the firemen and the working class people who are the LPs that own these same private equity holdings. And you've got uh, certain public funds that are doubling down in this space. So I think just there's, there's just a lot of misunderstanding, even at the highest levels of Congress, as to how our industry works. So I think that and I've talked to Jack Ingalls at AIMO, who's on our board, and there may be a space for uh, MFA. And I know a lot of your members, Ali, or members of both of those organizations that we've got to lobby for not better regulation, for better understanding. And as I said to both uh, for Jack and now Brian Corbett at MFA, we should be lobbying the media. And they should be writing, uh, and I don't want to get into the fake news, but I think there's a lot of, of print media and a lot of what we see on, on, uh, on the TV and internet that, that are just anti-alt for the sake of being anti-alt. And I think we've got to talk about both the benefits and the shortcomings. And I think to have something as provocative as the Stop Wall Street Looting Act is just unhelpful. I have to agree. Um, there's a few more questions here. John, as I as I promised, there was another one for you. Um, with the growth in hedge fund assets that you, you pointed out and the number of funds operating, do you have a perspective on the concentration of alpha? Well, I think this relates back to a couple questions that Bill answered too, which which relates to dispersion. So um, this this, I think, is reinforcing of something that Bill said earlier, which are these are not asset classes. I mean, maybe the, the the truth has been out on hedge funds for many years. We 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 like to use this kind of encapsulating category of hedge funds or diversifying strategies that capture a massive range of approaches and edge and processes uh, that span the full gamut. And so you talk to a sophisticated allocator, and they are looking for some diversifying strategies to add alpha. Um, and, and that is, those are edgy kind of particularly, uh, uh, somebody mentioned um, biotech earlier. These are particularly sector specific or process unique or black box quant strategies that are, that are looking to replicate a tradable strategy over the long term and beat the market in any environment. Most of these though are, uh, are strategies that are meant to proceed and be consistent outside or regardless of what the public markets are doing. Hence, the reason that hedge fund is a adjective. And I think we've forgotten that. Um, that's what it's meant to do. These macro funds, these long short, uh, these are meant to be producers of absolute return regardless of beta and regardless of the public markets. So you look at dispersion and just between a top fifth percentile quote hedge fund and a median. So remember, I'm just looking at the top half of this, this spectrum here, uh, is about 750 basis points. So you're talking seven and a half percent just between the an average and a world class one. Now, again, if you pick a if you pick a poorly performing one, you know that that runs into the thousands, as Bill said earlier. 
So it's hard to answer that question, but I would say that depending on what the allocator is looking at, they they are very intentionally focused on not picking, quote, the winners in the hedge fund space, but complementing their beta plays with very sophisticated and unique sources of alpha generation. And I think, I think we're going to see what we would tr traditionally call hedge funds or diversifying strategies zoom back into favor, but in a, to the, the questioner's point, in a much more concentrated, selective way. I think people have realized you can't just uh, plug in to hedge fund beta because it's just a, it's a massive uh, wild west of, of differentiating approaches to, to seeking, uh, seeking that outperformance. Okay, a few more questions. Uh, what percentage of hedge funds always preserve capital? Well, all if, if anytime I see always, I'd say zero. <laughs> I'm not I'm not exactly sure how to answer that question. Um, Bill, do you have a sense for what they're getting at? Uh, no, yeah, I, I think there are these uh, uh, market neutral absolute return uh, vehicles, and I think there are a lot out there. But uh, uh, if you're not uh, if you're not taking risk, you don't don't have any exposure. So I, I don't think there's any vehicle that could give you this uh, capital preservation in all markets. But uh, uh, but uh, having lower volatility clearly should be one path. But uh, beyond that, I don't really have much to add either. Okay, another question that's come in is, um, Bill, as you noted, um, the number of public companies is, is, is decimated, the small caps and the micro caps in particular. Um, these companies have been tough to trade and to hold. Are you concerned about that? Uh, I, I, yes, uh, for the aforementioned reasons that uh, you know, I, I think that uh, what makes uh, the capital markets great is is opportunity. And there's two things I'll point to. One I'll mention, and uh, I know John's going to have some thoughts on my other point as well. But uh, uh, Jeremy Grantham uh, did a, uh, a podcast with Patrick O'Shaughnessy uh, not too long ago. It's not behind a payroll wall. And if you haven't listened to Grantham, uh, he's excellent to listen to. He's uh, one of the founders of GMO. He's been around a long time. And when you get to be a certain age, uh, you can say stuff and get away with it. And uh, and if I'm unhinged, I don't know what to describe Jeremy as. But one of the things he talks about is he's got a foundation. And 60% of that foundation is in uh, venture capital. So maybe the, uh, the private market equivalent of some of these small and micro cap names. And one of the things he points out is that the public and, e and private equity markets are all about trading paper. Nothing is being created, no disease is being cured. And what really drives his interest in the VC space is that it's an innovation tank. So he's very, very focused on it. So the second point, which I'll tee up and pass on to John, is that uh, this is an area we've looked at a little bit as well, and, the, and maybe not to the questioner's uh, question, but the, the possibility of maybe using some of these smaller uh, names, the micro and small cap names, as a, public, as a private equity market uh, substitute, where you could own a basket, put a little bit of a lever, maybe a lot of bit of a lever on it, some kind of uh, drawdown protection, and you could maybe replicate it. And I know, John, we're doing something with Flagler on this. And uh, we talked to Randy Cohen at Harvard Business School, and he's got something he's working on. And it could be an interesting space uh, and maybe a part of the way of how we bridge the private and the public uh, markets in, in the equity space. So, John, I don't know if you have anything to add on that last point. It, yeah, no, I think I think it just speaks to the capital formation and, and our point on democratization is that much of the new economy, the growth economy per this questioner uh, is coming in the private markets now. Uh, and, you know, I was talking to somebody that that was in investment banking for his whole career until recently, uh, and he now works for a private company. And he was telling me that, look, when we were when we were running, he worked for a major investment bank that I won't name. But when we were running uh, in the glory days of the late 90s and early 2000s, what were the reasons you wanted to go public? Right. Well, one, it was a, a, a liquidity, a monetization issue for the founders. Right. Second, it was a currency for acquisition. Third, there was a bit of a halo kind of reputational effect. Like, look what we've done now. We're actually public, right? Uh, and fourth, of course, it was to raise capital to grow. 
And he was telling me that all four of these, and arguably the Halo one being perhaps most notable, is at least as available, if not more available in the private markets now. And so it, it goes to, to say that all these heavily intangible asset, high IP, um, high growth, early stage uh, R&D type organizations and business models uh, are much better off without the headache of the regulation and the short termism and Sarbox and, and all and activist investors and and what comes with listing um, uh, on the public markets, even in the most transparent and populist success, pu successful public market in the world, which is the United States. So I, I think there's, uh, you know, this is one of my statements I wrote to Elizabeth Warren is that, yes, there are significant shortcomings in the private markets as we are the first to say, as I opened with, but let's also not forget there's significant dysfunction in the way our public markets are working now too, that I think is accelerating this flee to the private markets. It's not pleasant to be public any longer, and it doesn't offer the same uh, pomp and circumstances it did 15 years ago. So uh, I think there's a lot of work to do in making sure that both of these markets, which both have value, both should coexist, but are serving their purpose as well. I think we have uh, one last question. Um, do you have any thoughts on the use of portfolio margining by hedge funds? Uh, so I, I don't, uh, I'm not sure if I fully followed the, the question. So yeah, as I said earlier, and I can, you know, I, I abated the name, but uh, you know, CalPERS is, is using effectively margin at the portfolio level. I think a lot of hedge funds, one of the tools they do deploy on a regular basis is the use of, of leverage uh, themselves too. And I think the only uh, concept is, uh, is uh, leverage cuts both ways. It's great on the upside, but but it's quite painful on the downs, downside as well. So ultimately, again, it might be off the, uh, the, the answer of this question, but Understanding the risks you're taking on is very, very important. Having a solid risk management function and team to make sure you understand how all the risks you're taking on, how they operate independently and together. Uh, and I think many times when you see crises coming up, it's a lack of understanding the risk that is taken on in the first place. So I think when it comes to any risk, having greater transparency and understanding is always a good thing. So uh, the, the comment is coming in that portfolio margining is greater than reg T leverage. It's at six to one just to, uh, to, to educate us all. Okay. Uh, I think we're pretty much at the end of our session. So I want to thank you and uh, both apologize for our awkward start. And thank you for the very interesting conversation, uh, Bill and John, and walking us through so much of the paper. It was incredibly interesting and informative. If anyone is interested in reaching out to our speakers individually, please make note of their contact information, which is currently on the screen. Or if you'd like to learn more about the CAIA designation or get a copy of the report, I encourage you to reach out to them. Um, with that, I'd like to um, highlight our next roundtable event is something that we're going to try. It's a little bit different. It's uh, our pre-4th of July uh, networking Zoom cocktail event where participants will have the opportunity to take part in small group marketing uh, networking breakouts. So with that, I hope you enjoyed today's presentation. Please stay safe, healthy, and enjoy the rest of your week. Thank you again, Bill and John. Thanks, Allie. Thanks, Thanks everyone. Bye. Take care.